if you read my talk description on Lanyard or somewhere else, then um, this isn't the talk you're looking for. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the uh, details of each and every little uh, real-time framework in Go because I think there's a better use of our time here. I gave this talk a week ago and uh, it just didn't seem right to me. So instead I'm going to try and make you fall in love with Go today and use it in your real-time system. So I'm going to talk about why that's awesome. Um, and hopefully that's a better experience than the one I had last week. Uh, so a little bit about me. My name's Patty. My contact information's up there. I've got my Twitter handle and my app.net handle. Uh, please heckle me on those services while I'm up here talking, so that'll make me laugh later when I get off the stage. Uh, I work as a developer experience engineer at Iron.io, um, where I company in the States. We do uh, distributed and kind of service-oriented architecture tools. Um, I work for them. My job's to make developers happy. I experienced middling success at this. Uh, I did find a company called Second Bit um, that uses Go on the back end. It's mainly because I like limited liability. Oh, Someone's heckling me. All right, I'm going to turn those off because that's going to be embarrassing otherwise. Just wait until somebody says something like inappropriate and I can't show my face in public again. All right. Uh, so yeah, I've got a small limited liability company just because I like not getting sued. I'm also a gopher. Um, you know how like you've got Ruby studs and you've got PH Prisoners of War. We have gophers. Uh, it's kind of like a team name like the Avengers or the Cool Kids Club. Um, the official hashtag for this talk is go on a boat. Please be nice. There are a lot of people out there that I respect, and I'm really terrified to be speaking in front of you right now. So uh, I probably will cry on stage if somebody's mean to me. Uh, so we're going to talk about Go here. What is Go? Go is a better C from the guys that didn't bring you C++. Uh, this is a joke we like to tell in the community. Um, really, Go is a modern C. It's compiled, it's statically typed, it's fast, it's elegant, and it's concurrent. And it's from Google. Um, but it is not part of Google distributed language. A lot of people contribute to it that aren't Google employees. Uh, it is entirely an open project, so it's not something that Google controls. Uh, it is compiled, but sanely. Uh, go build is how you build a project. There's no project metadata. There's no manifest files. There's no big make files. The code can, uh, the tools can read the code, figure out what your dependencies are, and statically compile them into a single binary, which is really cool. Um, it is a statically typed language, but without the stuttering. Like in Java, you've got to say int like six times before you can declare an int variable and assign a value to it. Here, it's got type inference, so it's just x is assigned to new uh, We've got maps, which have a value of uh, values that are integers and keys that are strings. It's all very straightforward. It's all really they focused a lot on making the syntax clean, simple to use, and very simple to read. Um, so it is also fast, but not just fast when executing. It is compiled language, so it's fast when executing. And one of the design goals is to have it approach C in performance. Um, but it's also supposed to be fast when compiling as well. Uh, and I think that's really important, because having a good feedback loop for developers is really important. Um, we did actually go 1.1, just released a beta, and on the mailing list, somebody said, hey, you know, I've got this project with like 60 dependencies, and it's, I think there might be a bug in go 1.1 because it's really slowing down for me. The build took like almost a second the other day, and it was really problematic. So uh, yeah, one second compile times are a bug in Go. Um, but here's my favorite. It's an elegant language. They really focused hard on making it so that it's very simple to use this. I include a quote here. I'm not going to read it to you because you can all read, and uh, I respect your intelligence. So you can read the quote. This is from the Go FAQ. But I think it's really telling that that's from the like official FAQ for the language. Because Go uh, Andrew Durand, one of the Go developer evangelists and one of the core Go team members, said that um, the great thing about Go is that what the code does is exactly what it says on the page. Like the simplest way to express your ideas is generally the right way to do it in Go, which I think is a really awesome feature of a language and something that other languages don't really take into account enough. Um, so Go is elegant, and I'll show you some elegant Go later, um, or at least Go later. It's my Go, so it might not be elegant. Uh, but Go is also, this is kind of like the flagship feature of Go. It's a concurrent language. Uh, and the maximum we use is don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. It's the idea that you're going to be passing data around between these independent processes instead of um, kind of coordinating these processes. I'm going to go 
go through a couple of examples of that. And but if you're interested about concurrency, there's like a lot of talk about the difference between concurrency and parallelism. So the Heroku's conference. Uh, if you Google for it, it's also on the GoLang website, which I will. the action now. Um, I've got a URL here. Uh, if anybody, I'm not going to ask all of you to do it because the wireless is going to crash and things are going to go bad. Um, but yeah, if you look here or pull up on their laptops or devices here, grow up .go on a boat Um I want to know what you want to be when you grow up. And I'll do this here live as well. I'm going to sit down the tablet and break everything. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be Iron Man. That's like my thing. Uh, I love Iron Man. I want to be Iron Man when I grow up. Oh, my connection closed. We're going to reach out this again. Please, wireless hurt me, work for me. I am totally tempting the demo gods here. Someone wants to be Batman. All right. I want to be Iron Man. Hooray. All right. Anyone else? Let's see. I'm going to leave this up. Oh, we got the theme song. Oh, someone wants to be me. You don't want to be me. Uh, it's hard being me. Uh, all right, so let's, oops, I need my slides back here. All right, so let's pull back the curtain and look at this. Uh, depending on how you say it. Um, GoFoomt is really cool because it lets you end all of your uh, internal wars about, you know, should we be using tabs or spaces. It just automatically converts all of your code to be using this canonical style, which you can configure, uh, which is really cool. Um, but here I'm just telling it to remove all of my comments, uh, parse all of the Go files in my directory, and do a line count on it. And that's 216 lines, that example I just showed you. Um, and this example was shamelessly inspired, quote unquote, by uh, and it's using this wonderful library. Um, it's an awesome library. It's an awesome example. I kind of adapted it to my needs, but uh, credit where credit is due, he totally came up with it. Um, and processes. We're talking about concurrency today, so there are these three processes that we're working uh, They all have one and only one job, so hopefully they do it well. Uh, so our first kind of process is the history, and that's why I was able to, when I refreshed the page, show what other people had said before the page had loaded. Um, so the structure of history this is basically a type in Go. Uh, you're declaring a type, and it's going to be a struct, and it's the history type. And I'm basically just storing a two-dimensional slice of bytes, a writer, and a reader that are chans. And chans are channels. They're how you pass uh, memory and information around in Go, uh, which is really cool. Uh, and you'll notice that second one there is a reader. So channels are a type themselves, but they also have a type associated with it, which is a little bit difficult to wrap your mind around at first, but like for example, chan byte is a channel that's going to uh, be sending and receiving a slice of bytes. Uh, a chan of a chan of bytes is going to be a channel that is sending and receiving channels that will be sending and receiving types uh, that are slices of bytes. Because I heard you like channels, so I put a channel inside your channel. Um, so now we've got our history type defined here, we need to pay attention to what people are saying. Uh, so we're going to start listening, and this is what's called a go routine. Uh, oh, this is not actually a go routine yet. I'm lying to you. I apologize. Uh, I'm starting basically an infinite loop here yet, uh, which is just four. So as long as four is true, we're going to loop. Um, and then there's this cool thing here called a select. Statements are things you use with channels. So here's how you receive on a channel over here, this little arrow see here. Um, and what we're doing is we're uh, this chunk here says. We're going to whatever you pass through h dot writer, which has to be a slice of bytes, it's going to be assigned to this message variable. And uh, then we're going to append the messages to a global uh, set of messages there. But what the select statement does is it says we're going to listen for either input on the h dot writer or the h dot reader. And whichever one we get first, that's the one we're going to go ahead and execute that block. It's kind of like a uh, switch statement, but for change. Um, and because this is an infinite loop, we're basically just going to keep reading on both of these channels. 
Uh, so the writer is going to write to our, glo uh, our global slice of bytes here, which is h.messages, two-dimensional slice of bytes. Um, so we're going to append our there. So that's basically just keeping a log. And then when the reader comes in, uh, again, remember that's passing a channel. So we're going to go through our log of bytes, and we're just going to send them back through the channel we received. Then we're going to close the channel. Close just sends, says, I have no more data to send you. Um, and that's going to be important later. So finally, to be able to use our, share, our history, we need to be able to tell people what was in the history. Uh, but rather than just reading this out of there, which you might think is the right way to do it, we're going to have concurrency problems with that. Because what happens if I'm writing while somebody else is reading? That's a problem. So instead, we're going to pass the data out through that response channel. So here we've got the response. We're going to make a channel that's got a slice of bytes. And then we're going to send to the reader the response uh, channel that we just made. Then the result, we're going to initiate just the slice of slice of bytes to hold a result. Um, and we're going to loop through the response channel, which, again, as long as this channel has more information to send us until it gets that close message, it's going to loop through there and assign the result, that slice of bytes, to a new uh, slice within the two-dimensional slice. So we're, again, just kind of copying that history data out of the type structure itself. And we're going to return, uh, return that result. And that's basically our history in a nutshell. Um, so then we've got, of course, the WebSockets. This is kind of like the controller. This is the bulk of our application here. Um, so we're going to define a WebSocket connection, which is just a uh, WebSocket connection and a channel that you can send uh, an array of bytes to, or a slice of bytes to to have it sent through this WebSocket. Um, to read from WebSockets, we're just creating an infinite loop here. This is called a defer statement. Defer statements are really cool. They let you uh, designate a chunk of code that you want executed at the end of this function no matter what. If you panic, if you return, no matter where you return from, um, basically anything besides, like I think, a, a kernel fault at this point, we'll call this defer function. So what we're going to say here is we want to, at the end of this function, when this returns, we want to close off, we want to uh, unregister this WebSocket from our hub, and we want to close the WebSocket connection. Very simple stuff. We're also going to set a read limit and a read deadline on our WebSocket um, so that people can't uh, all of our memory by trying to send us like gigabytes and keep the connection open indefinitely. Further on here, then we've just got another infinite loop um, that's going to get a reader from a WebSocket. Um, a reader is just an interface, which is static duct typing, which is really interesting. Um, basically, anything a slice of bytes is going to fulfill that reader interface. So here we're going to get a WebSocket opcode, we're going to get a reader, and we're going to get an error return if there's an error returned. So if the error is not equal to nil, so if we did get an error, um, otherwise we're going to have a reader in the operation it's supposed to be performing. So this is the last reading one. I'm sorry, I know I'm talking a lot about these, but it's hard to break up code into slides. Uh, we're going to switch. So this is like our select, but it's a switch instead. So depending on the value of op, we're going to execute one of these cases. If it's an op pong, then we're just going to increase the read deadline. If it's an op text, so if we're getting an actual message, we're going to use the IO utils read all to read all that information, assign it to a message. Uh, if there's an error doing that, we're going to break out of it. And then we're going to broadcast that message through our hub and we're going to append it to our history by sending to that message history writer on the channel, which is what we defined in the uh, history section. So then, we, of course, we've got to be able to write a single message, um, which is basically just wrapping the WebSocket write message function. And it's also a, uh, increment uh, extending our deadline. Sorry. So then to write, we've got another one of our uh, infinite loops down there. But first, we're going to use what's called a ticker. And a ticker is this really cool structure in Go that's going to send on the channel um, after a specific amount of time, in this case, our ping period. We're going to do another defer function here to stop the ticker after uh, the method's done. And we're going to close off the WebSocket connection. 
another select statement. If the if we can send the message, um, then we're going to or sorry, yeah, if we can send the message. So unless OK returns a problem, we're going to close off the WebSocket. Uh, and if there is an error sending the message, then we're going to return. But if the ticker sends a message, then we're going to send out a ping request to the WebSocket, uh, just so we can kind of keep a ping keep alive thing going. And then finally, we've got to upgrade. Again, very simple stuff. This is how you do an HTTP server in Go. Well, actually, this is a server function in Go. Um, you've got the response writer, which is what you write your response data to. And then you've got your request. Um, we're going to create a WebSocket upgrade from the response writer and the request. If there's a handshake error, then we're going to throw a 400 error. Otherwise, we're going to log the error and return. Um, we're going to create one of our connections that we defined way back at the top um, with a channel of bytes uh, and a WebSocket that we just created. Uh, we're going to register that with our hub, and we're going to start the writer and reader loops. Um, whoop. I'm losing. Oh, my interface got lost there. All right, so we're going to move over to the laptop. Woo! Then finally, this is the last part of the WebSockets, I promise, the hub. And the hub is just a, connect, a big collection of your connections and then channels that you can broadcast, register, and unregister with. And there's how the hub is initialized as a global variable. Um, when you run the hub, you're basically just uh, checking to wait for information from a, one of those channels. You're registering, you're adding it to the global map. Unregister, you're deleting it from the global map, including the channel. And when you're broadcasting, you're looping through that global map and sending a message. Um, very straightforward stuff. And finally, we've got the server. This is the last part of the application. And this is just a glorified JavaScript delivery mechanism, because there's not really anything that uh, you've got to do with it at this point. Uh, I'm setting up some flags and globals here. I want it to run on port 8080. Uh, I want to pass in an HTML file to load. Um, I'm going to initialize the template, but I'm not going to set assign a value to it yet. And I'm also going to create this history object uh, so that we can store our history. Template data is going to just be uh, the host that we're on and the history uh, as a slice of strings. And then when we serve requests, again, we see our response writer in our request. We're going to set the content type. We're going to obtain a copy of the history. We're going to make, this is like the dirty little hack of this demo. Uh, I apologize. This isn't the correct way to do it, but it's the only way I could do it that would fit within a slide. We're going to go through the temp messages. We're going to create a new slice that has the length of the old slice. We're going to loop through the old slice, and we're going to convert everything to a string. So I'm taking a slice of bytes. I'm converting it to strings. Um, we're creating template data based off that. And then we're executing the template, which is going to send the HTML down to the browser. Um, and then to pull it all together, we're just going to parse all the flags. The main function is what's going to run every time your Go program is run. So we're going to parse the flags. We're going to require the template to be compiled. If it's not compiled, it's going to panic, um, which is kind of like our exceptions. It throws an error. Everything comes crashing to a halt. Um, we're going to start up our hub. We're going to start up our history. And then we're going to tell it that when we get a request to the root directory, we want to serve that HTTP we just defined. When we get a request to slash WS, then we want to serve the WebSocket handler. Uh, and then we're going to tell it to listen to those addresses and serve them. Um, and that's the entire function. That's it. That's everything. That I, I literally just walked you through everything that in that uh, demo. If you don't believe me, I put the GitHub URL up there. That also has the source for my slides and the Android app I was controlling my slides with. Um, so just a very quick recap. Am I doing okay on time? Do I have time for a recap? A little bit? All right, it's very quick. I promise it's like three slides. Um, recap for the people that spent the talk heckling me on Twitter. Uh, Go routines are elegant. Cheap concurrency is awesome. Channels are awesome and because Go routines like to communicate. WebSockets are magic. Um, and the Gopher is adorable. This is like the mascot of the Go programming language. It doesn't have a name, but it's adorable. Um, Go and real time are awesome. Um, and you're going to check out Go. Uh, so, golang.org is the main 
website. Tour.goLang.org is like an interactive demo that will teach you all of the fundamentals of the language. And there's the Google group, which uh, people like Rob Pike hang out on. It's a very disconcerting experience to have Rob Pike tell you why what you're doing is wrong. Because so you sit there for a moment and you're like, shouldn't you be like making a self-driving car or preventing the robot apocalypse? Um, but yeah, no, they totally hang out. They're very friendly people. Uh, and they helped me learn, so I'm sure they will help smart people like you learn as well. Uh, and that's my talk. Thank you.